All right. We are live. And good morning to each and every one of you at Shore Bible Church South. Appreciate you being here today for our Sunday school. And good morning to those out in Meadowland, Facebook land. We appreciate you being here as well. Uh, let me say grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever and ever. Uh, we're going to have our Sunday school lesson here. My name is Bobby Brown, the good Bobby Brown. I'm trying to humbly take the place <laughs> of our master teacher, George Crump. I'll do the, as best I can by the grace of God. So, um, yeah, I appreciate it. I was, uh, it was good to hear that Pastor Jordan is uh, back home and Amen. supposed to be at the uh, church today of just be listening, not, not teaching. But I appreciate his ministry. As a matter of fact, I'm going to steal a principle of his ministry right here. So, <laughs> so I want to thank him for that. So our Sunday school lesson for today, let's, let's begin with a word of prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for being you, the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for his cross work. We thank you for that simple gospel of salvation today that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And each and every one of us that believes that fact and that fact alone in our inner man, our inner person, results in our being identified or baptized into the body of Christ spiritually. And we thank you for that. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the spirit. Thank you for the apostle Paul. And we're trusting that each and every person that is listening today will uh, get something that they could share with others so that they are edified and you will be glorified. And we look forward to that in Christ's name. Amen. 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 So we're going to talk about uh, a gospel you can believe. Now, um, Pastor Jordan does a series when uh, he sort of gives basic principles for how he looks at how a grace church should be taught or should be built. And he has these five basic pillars or principles of building a grace believing local assembly. And these five points are as follows for your notes. Pastor Jordan wants to make sure that you have a gospel you can believe. That's number one, and that's our point for today. Number two, a, a Bible you can trust. And number three, a study that you can understand. Number four, a life you can live. And number five, a purpose you can fulfill. And I like that. I'll repeat them so uh, you can maybe if you're taking notes. So those five pillars for or points or principles for building a grace assembly would be, number one, a gospel you can believe. Number two, a Bible you can trust. Number three, a study you can understand. Number four, a life you can live. And number five, a purpose you can fulfill. So in my opinion, these points are the they're basic, they're biblically based, and they should be the basis for building any local assembly in the dispensation of grace today. If you desire to build the assembly and desire for your people to grow according to the will of God for today, those, those points are good. So we're just going to look at the first point, a gospel you can believe. So let's uh, read 1 Timothy 2. If you turn in your Bible to 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 to 7, it talks about salvation. Paul talks about the salvation of due time gospel the gospel, the grace of God. It was given by the Lord Jesus Christ to and through our apostle, the apostle of Gentiles, the apostle Paul. So 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 through 7 is as follows. But this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. Well, this is kind of interesting. Uh, you see a 
First Timothy chapter two, verse four there. It says, who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. So that salvation there, that's initial salvation, is justification. And then, and to come into the knowledge of the truth, that's discipleship or spiritual growth. So you can see that these are two different things. These are two different things. Initial salvation or justification before God and spiritual growth are two separate and distinct things. It's kind of like your, your physical birth and then you're growing up and maturing and becoming a decent human being. They're, they're two different things. They're two different things. And that, that's kind of important. And verse 5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Now, this, this is, I like this because one God of the universe, right? The one true living God of the universe is the God of the Bible. And we, and we know this through the prophetic scriptures. And it says that Jesus is the mediator between God and, and men. If you go back in Job chapter 9, Job was wondering how to be right before God. And, and he was talking about someone like a daysman to be betwixt the two, right? A person that could lay his hand on the shoulder of God and lay his hand on the shoulder of men and bring us together, right? The daysman. And that's, that's what Christ has done. So in order to do that, Christ had to be a man, and he had to be God, right? In order to be that in friction between. And a little bit, this is, uh, Jamie, you and I talk about the kinsman redeemer, yes. where God, you know, to redeem man, had to be a man. He had to be a, a kinsman to, to man. He, he's not an angel, didn't become an angel, and that's why angels can't, can't be saved, because that law of the kinsman redeemer. So it's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. And see in verse 6, who gave himself a ransom for all, see, to be testified in due time. Okay, ransom being you're being brought back. All right, we were we were enslaved into our, the sin nature, enslaved to the system, a satanically inspired system, and Christ brought us out with his death, burial, death, burial, and resurrection on the cross. But that message, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ on the cross for mankind in general, was a due time, it says there, meaning it wasn't manifested until a certain time. And we'll see that time is with the salvation of the Apostle Paul. And verse 7 says, Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. So the Apostle Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles with this new due time gospel. And he's preaching this, he's teaching this, he's being sent around to, to show and to share with everyone the gospel, the grace of God in truth and verity. That's what the verity means, the truth. So he's sharing the grace principles that Christ has been sharing with him as Christ makes the appearances to show Paul what the gospel, the grace of God is all about. So uh, going back to verse four, we talked about the two different things of salvation, initial salvation, spiritual growth. Yeah, that's that's kind of interesting because um, these are two separate things. Spiritual growth is your discipleship. Salvation is the initial uh, salvation is the initial justification before God. And this means that a person can be truly saved uh, and still act like a spiritual idiot. All right. Uh, I think that's why God put the book of Corinthians in the Bible, to be honest. With you. <laughs> uh, in fact, these spiritual idiots can be even worse than unsaved people. You see, first Corinthians uh, five, one, where a member of the uh, Corinthian assembly had a relationship with his father's wife, which is kind of a little weird. Um, I presume that was his stepmother, but uh, you never know. But the thing is, Paul was saying even the Gentiles didn't do this. <laughs> So, so these truly spiritual idiots, yet they were saved. So the Corinthian assembly shows just how low a believer can go and, and still be saved due to being ignorant of that spiritual process of, of growth. So how many times does uh, Paul tell the members of the body of Christ, I would not have ye ignorant or something to that effect? I mean, so many times, and you can jot these uh, scriptures down for your notes, Romans 1.13 uh, Romans eleven twenty five. Now that's about the mystery, the secret, the dispensation of grace. Uh, how it was a secret 
and how God had temporarily set the nation of Israel aside and brought in the mystery, the body of Christ, and then he'll get back to nation Israel's or the kingdom program. So that's Romans eleven twenty five and First Corinthians ten one, First Corinthians twelve one, First Corinthians fourteen thirty eight, Second Corinthians one eight, Second Corinthians two eleven, and First Thessalonians four thirteen. That's about the rapture. He's revealing about the rapture, the mystery of the rapture. Now, if you notice how, how many of these are written to the Corinthians, right? <laughs> in the Corinthian assembly, they were very ignorant of who they were in Christ. So they didn't know what God had made Christ to be to them or who they were in Christ. So if you have a sense of your being a, in the past a, a spiritual idiot or, in, or even in the future, no need to be discouraged, right? <laughs> Don't be discouraged. There's hope for you and me who have the completed can of scripture and, the, and these great teachers we have to encourage us. So there, there's hope. So what is the message today? Uh, so what we're going to see is that the message for salvation today is not, repeat, not in what are known as the gospel books of the Bible, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, or early Acts, chapters 1 through 8 is not there. Okay, the, the gospel message for today is not pray the sinner's prayer. It's not ask Jesus into your heart. That's so sweet. I like that. <laughs> and, <laughs> Ask Jesus into your heart, not accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, not make Jesus Lord of your life. And it's not that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and God raised him from the dead. That's, that all sounds good, but that's, that's not the message for today. The gospel that saves or justifies the believer before God today was a due time gospel that was uh, given first to our apostle, apostle of the Gentiles, the apostle. Paul. And that's in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4. So let's go over there. We want to just nail that down. I know you're going to hear this many times, but it's always good. So 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4, the gospel for today. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein ye stand, and which also you are saved if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And I like that focus on the scriptures. It's what saith the scriptures. That's what the Bible says. Not what people say, not what you've heard, not what the TV, the preacher, the Bible teacher says. It's what saith the scriptures. So the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ is foretold in the scriptures. But its application to us, the body of Christ, the spiritual heavenly kingdom, was not revealed until after Paul is saved. All right. So it's an interesting thing. He was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And we have to believe that message individually in our hearts, in our inner man, our inner person. Right. So generally, if people... If, if people point to themselves, they generally don't go like this, or they don't, they don't go like this. Or How does a person point to themselves? How do you point to Yeah. You, like this. That's where you believe. That's where you believe this message, that Christ died for your sins personally, according to the scriptures, was buried and rose again for your justification. So that's the message for today. And look at Romans eleven thirteen. you'll see how Paul, and this is very, very important. Romans eleven thirteen, 13, Paul says, For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentile, I magnify mine office. So important to remember in the dispensation of grace that Paul is your apostle. Personally, not Peter, not James, not John. It's the apostle Paul. All right, so... Um, he has an office because I magnify mine office. He has an office over the body of Christ. So you can, you can think of Paul. I kind of think of him as the Moses of the body of Christ, right? So God saved Moses, gave the law through Moses, and dispensed that to the nation of Israel. And when that was rejected, God went to a new program and saved the apostle Paul, gave him the grace message, and gave that to us through the Pauline epistles, right? That's Romans through Philemon. That's 13 epistles. And if you think about it, I mean, what, there's 66 books of the Bible. 
Paul wrote 13. It's like 20%. You think God is trying to tell you something? That comes from that movie. What's that? The Color Purple? Remember that song? <laughs> you think God is trying to tell you something? Right? 13 epistles. Listen to this man. Follow this man. Follow me as I follow Christ. Right? Follow me. He, Christ in heaven is telling you constantly, follow me, follow me, follow me, follow me through the apostle Paul. Amen. That's so important, right? It's so important to recognize that Saul, who became Paul, is your apostle. So important. Romans 16, 25, he was given a special message. Romans 16, 25, he was given a special message. Turn to Romans 16, 25. He, uh, he promised in early Romans there, chapter one, somewhere along there, that he was going to give the, the Romans a gift that was going to establish them. Now, at the end of the book of Romans here, Romans 16, 25, he gives that gift. And it says, now to him that is a power to establish you according to my gospel. Just that one word, my. Paul is distinguishing his message from Peter and the 11. When he says my, that, that, that's personal pronoun possessive for you teachers out there is my gospel not Peter's, not James not John, like when you say my my house, my car, my spouse right, it's different from your car, your house, your spouse so that distinguishes his message his good news from others my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, kept secret since the world began but now is made manifest so Paul's message is distinct from Peter's and the 11. The common thought in denominationalism in the, in the world in general is that Peter and Paul had the same message. But as we're clearly seeing, Paul's message is distinct from the 12. But we're going to see that more and more often. Uh, in the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Christ is being preached according to the fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, a literal, visible Davidic kingdom on the earth. And you can see that just a couple of spots here. Jeremiah 23, 5 to 8. Turn to Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah 23, 5 to 8. Jeremiah 23, 5 to 8. That's page 1200 in my Bible. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremiah 23, 5 to 8. And here Jeremiah speaking to the nation of Israel says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice. Where? In the earth. You see? In his days, Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely, and this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that they shall no more say, The Lord liveth, which brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But the Lord liveth, which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country and from all countries where I had driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. Do you see that? The Old Testament talks about the land, the king, the kingdom, the Messiah, the Davidic kingdom. All right. That's so important to recognize that. That's what the Bible talks about. In Daniel 2.44, you look at that, at that and it's, of course, it's all over the place. I'll just give you a couple here. In Daniel 2.44, and you'll see in the context here, it's talking about this. Uh, these are literal kingdoms that are being talking about in this dream that the, uh, the king had. And now Daniel is giving the dream and it's interpreting the dream. And um, there's a literal kingdom, a literal kingdom, a literal kingdom. It's going to fourth, first, second, third, fourth kingdom. He goes down there in verse uh, 0, 40, 41, about the fourth kingdom. Then when he gets to Daniel 2, 44, and in the days of the, these kings shall the God of heaven, heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. So most people reading this, again, kind of interpret it as being the body of Christ and spiritual thing. But the context is clearly a literal kingdom on the earth. Every one of the kingdoms that are talked about in this dream are literal kingdoms. 
So when the God of heaven sets up a kingdom, it's going to be a little kingdom on the earth. It's right in the context. It's just that simple. It's just a matter of believing the words on the page in context. All right. Remember, when you get over to what they call the New Testament in Luke 16, 16, uh, Christ said that the law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth into it. Right. Pastor Johnson's favorite uh, <laughs> verse here. But they're pressing into a literal kingdom on the earth. OK. Matthew 5, 17. Matthew 5, 17. Think not. That I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, Christ says, but to fulfill. He come to do what the Old Testament was talking about, the literal kingdom on the earth at that time. Matthew 6, 10, that's the Sermon on the Mount. You know, Christ is teaching his disciples to pray. And they pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Mm -hmm. right? It's so important. Again, this earthly kingdom, not talking about the body of Christ. Matthew 8, 11, and I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. The literal, visible, Davidic kingdom promised to Israel on the earth. So you sit down in a, on a literal kingdom, on the throne, right? Matthew 19, 28, and Jesus said unto them, his disciples, Verily I say unto you that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. A literal, visible, Davidic kingdom promised to Israel on the earth. Yes. So important. That's the context we're talking about. That's the context that Christ is born. And that's the context where he says in Mark 1, 14, 15, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled. What tense is that word is? Present tense. Present tense. That's Mark 1, 14 to 15. The time is fulfilled. So Christ is telling the people at that time that this kingdom is, everything is in place to be, to be done in this kingdom, and the kingdom of God is, present tense, at hand. So at the time that Christ is on earth and earthly ministry, that that kingdom, the little kingdom on the earth is at hand. It's within the grasp, within the lifetimes of the people he is speaking to at that time. All right. So important at that time. So we got to you got to see what God is saying to the people at that time before we start trying to apply anything. And he was the king. Yeah, he was the Messiah. Yes, and he's, the, he's the Messiah. He is the Messiah. Everything was in place to be fulfilled. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. This is not the gospel about the body of Christ. People reading this and read it into uh, something that's not there, right? They're taking Paul's message of the gospel of grace of God and reading it into the, uh, the other scriptures. Yep. And what's that called again, uh, Jamie? That's Isa Jesus. Isa Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Brother James' favorite word. <laughs> private interpretation. It is, okay. The private you're trying to read into the scriptures something that's not there. And right. your leaders are telling you this in your ears. And then when you go back, you've been trained not to believe the Bible, the words on the page. It. It's, it's amazing. Satan is so deceptive. It's right there in your face, mm -hmm. and you're sitting there and you're reading into it something that's not there. Right. And it makes a huge difference in your Christian lives. Now, this is not about the gospel of uh, the body of Christ. This is the earthly kingdom program for Israel. And our apostle Paul confirms this in Romans 15, 8, where he says, now I say that Jesus Christ was, now what, what tense is that? Was. Past tense, right? In his earthly ministry, he was a minister of the circumcision, that's the Jew, for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. All right, so he came to confirm it, he came to do it, now, Paul's due time gospel, the grace of God to form the body of Christ, was first given to Paul after the nation of Israel rejected her Messiah. And this rejection was not at the cross. That's what people think once Christ dies on the cross. Oh, OK, now it's my program now. So they just get rid of Israel right away. <laughs> All right. But it's not at the cross that the rejection was uh, officially made. The cross was a stumbling block to the nation of Israel. You look at 1 Corinthians 1.23. 
And there are a couple of other scriptures, like Romans 9.32 and Romans 11.11, but we'll just go to one of them because it won't take a lot of time. 1 Corinthians 1. 1 Corinthians 1.23. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. So Israel stumbled at the cross, but she did not fall. Remember in Luke 23, 34, Christ prayed from the cross for Father God to forgive Israel, which God did. So God continued the nation Israel's earthly kingdom program right through the Gospels of the, of the Bible. Right after the cross, he continued Israel's earthly kingdom program and even the early chapters of the book of Acts 1 through 8. Still Israel's earthly kingdom program. The literal kingdom for the nation Israel was offered. I mean, this is the icing on the cake. The kingdom was actually offered to the nation of Israel in Acts 3, 19 through 21. Let's go over and read uh, Acts 1, 6, just to get a little flavor of that. Acts, Acts 1, 6. So the kingdom is being offered here in early Acts. They weren't talking about the body of Christ <laughs> before that is being offered to the nation of Israel now. Remember, they had the disciples had this Bible study uh, with, with Christ. And uh, and when they finished, Acts 1, 6 says, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Now, what type of kingdom were they talking about? A literal kingdom on the earth, right? He said, again, what type of kingdom Israel had before? It was a literal kingdom on the earth. So restore again the kingdom to Israel. Now, that means... What they were talking about when they were doing this Bible study was the literal kingdom for Israel on the earth. That's what they were talking about. Yes. Now, the Lord said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the, or the seasons which the father has put in his own power. So he just said, telling them to go out and preach about the, about the kingdom. And uh, we'll, we'll see about the timing. But restore again the kingdom, the a literal kingdom on the earth. And then in Acts 3, let's go to Acts 3. Uh, I'm going to take a good chunk here. Let's see. Acts 3, 14 through 21. You see, you see the offer of the kingdom here. And you'll see Peter is preaching to uh, the Jews. And he's preaching the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But he's not preaching it as good news. He's preaching it as bad news. All right. And see in verse 14, Acts 3, verse 14. But ye denied the Holy One and just. And the just and desire the murder to be granted unto you and kill the prince of life whom God has raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, made this man strong whom you see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him that hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of y'all. It's a miracle. And now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance ye did it, as did also your rulers. But the, those things which were God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he has so fulfilled. Now, here's the offer of the kingdom. Repent ye, mean change your thinking. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. See, about the kingdom on the earth. And he's, and he's, and look at verse 20. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. What does it say? He's going to send Jesus Christ. What does it mean? He's going to send Jesus Christ. It's just that simple, which before was uh, preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until there's going to be a slight delay until this gets out and people have a chance to accept or reject. Verse 21, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things. Amen. See that word restitution? Remember when they asked that question in Acts 1, 6, Lord, this time will you restore again the kingdom to Israel? So those, words, those words are related. Well, they even sound like anything is right. Restore. And restitution. Mm -hmm. So they're talking about here in verse 21, the literal kingdom on the earth. Okay. Which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So there is the offer of the kingdom. So the Jews will not be able to say to God, hey, God, when Christ first came, you really didn't mean uh, my kingdom. You meant this little body of Christ thing. That, no, 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 no. God will get out the Bible. Acts <laughs> three. <laughs> he'll, he'll go right here. He said, you see here and put their nose right. Here's the offer of the kingdom. You refuse. 
All right. So you can see if, if, if the kingdom is being talked about here in Acts 3, it's all about the kingdom in Acts 2, Acts 1, the Gospels, and all the way back. All right. So it's important that you get the proper interpretation of, of the scriptures. And interpretation means what God meant to the people he was speaking to at that time. And then you can start to see what, how it applies to you. Paul will tell you how to, how to uh, apply the scriptures. But I don't see too many people building arcs today or doing animal sacrifices. People, people understand that. They got to rightly divide that. Okay, they, just, they, they know that. So you just got to apply that same principle all the way across. All right? So the earthly kingdom offer was rejected by the nation Israel and her leaders by the stoning of Stephen in Acts chapter 7. And what that did was it officially sent the message to God, we will not have this man to reign over us. That's the official message. This is Luke, remember Luke 19, 14, where the parable of the nobleman in a far country, where Christ indicated he would be officially rejected by Israel while he was away in heaven or in the far country. Right? The due time gospel, the grace of God that forms the body of Christ today, was first given to Apostle Paul, the Apostle of the Gentiles, by the risen Lord Jesus Christ, who personally, imagine that, personally came down from heaven, whoo, <laughs> and spoke to Paul to give Paul what he calls my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. What was Peter talking about in Acts 3? A message that was what? Spoken since the world began. Right. You see that language? One spoken, kept secret. Right. So there's two different messages. If you just relax, breathe in, relax, listen to the words on the page, It'll, it'll be very, very obvious. So let's go to 1 Timothy 1, 12 to 16, because we want to see how it was given to Paul first. Okay. 1 Timothy 1. 1 Timothy 1. Twelve to sixteen. First Timothy one, twelve to sixteen. First Timothy one, <clears throat> verse twelve. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant, which with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause, I obtain mercy that in me first, you see, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him everlasting. So you can see there in verse 13, the Paul says he was a blasphemer. Paul was there holding the coats of them who were stoning Stephen. The Holy Ghost was speaking through Stephen. And Paul was holding the coats of them. Paul, Saul, Saul is committing the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. Said, and according to what uh, Jesus said, you cannot be saved. All right? You say a word against the Son, it will be forgiven you. you. Say a word against the Father, it will be forgiven you. That's in Matthew 12, 32. But if you say a word against the Holy Ghost, it will not be forgiven you, neither in this world or the world to come. You cannot be saved. Saul committed that blasphemy. So in order for God to, to save Saul and not conflict with himself, he had to change the program. <laughs> That's why we say the body of Christ began with Paul. Right? Paul was the first member of the body of Christ. He changed the program. He changed to the dispensation of grace and opened up the body of Christ program and turned Saul into Paul. It's amazing. Amazing grace. And Christ, in verse 15, came from heaven to appear first to Paul and gave Paul the gospel of the grace of God. Absolutely amazing. And we see that uh, Paul's message is different from Peter's gospel, the literal kingdom. So Paul's, Peter's gospel was the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the fulfillment of prophecy that was spoken since the world began. We talked about that earlier. Uh, Luke 170, you'll see it's spoken since the world began. So jot that scripture down. And then Acts 321 that we read where the offer of the kingdom was, that was also a message that was spoken since the world began. So you can see the spoken since the world began program. Luke 1, beginning of what we call the Gospels, 
all the way out past Acts 3. So Acts 3 is the gospel of the kingdom, spoken since the world began. Acts 2, spoken since the world began. <laughs> Acts 1, the Great Commission, all that spoken since the world began is one solid program. All right, it makes it, it hasn't nothing has changed going to the body of Christ. Nothing has changed, not until Paul comes along. All right. So the body of Christ program is nowhere being discussed or formed in the Old Testament, nor the gospel books of uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, nor at the so-called Great Commission at the end of these books. It's not there. The body of Christ is unsearchable, untraceable, untrackable. But in the first Corinthians 2, 7 to 8 and Ephesians 3, 4 to 10. And I challenge anyone listening to uh, find, if you can, anywhere in the Bible where God says, I am forming or I have formed or I will form a heavenly kingdom body of believers where Jew and Gentile are saved on the same level and approach to God. But apart from the nation of Israel, apart from the law and apart from the land. Show me anywhere in scripture where that is said before Paul is saved. Mm -hmm. You won't find it because the Bible says it was a mystery. It was a secret, kept secret since the world began. It's unsearchable, untraceable, untrackable. And if you, if you go to 1 Corinthians 2, 6 to 8, you will see how well, God kept his mouth closed about the mystery because if he had written about the mystery in the Old Testament or anywhere else before Saul, then the adversary who knows the Bible better than probably than most of us, all of us probably, <laughs> Uh, the adversary would have saw that, oh, by killing Christ, he would kill himself. And he would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So that's why he kept it a secret, a total secret. So it's not there. Again, people doing their eyes at Jesus take what Paul is writing and they read it back into the gospel. And it's a mess. Big mistake. Big mistake. Yeah, it's a mess. This is the key to properly understanding your Bible and finding out who you are in Christ. And what God has made Christ to be to you. Again, we're interpreting the Bible in context, what it meant to the people at that time. I think what happens is people get interpretation, what it meant to the people at that time. They get it mixed up with application, what it means to them. So they're trying to apply something before they even interpret it. Can you imagine that? If you're reading a book about how to defuse a bomb, and then you start jumping in there and... <laughs> I think you're going to have a problem, right? You got to make sure you clearly understand what it's saying in context. If it says, do not cut the red wire, I suggest you do not cut the red wire, okay? It, it means what it says and says what it means. I mean, it's, it's so important. Then the Bible just opens up. It's, it's, it's awesome. Paul's due time gospel, the grace of God, is that now in our dispensation today, each individual is justified on the same level before God by believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for their personal salvation. Again, apart from the nation of Israel, apart from the land, apart from the law. And for your notes, you can put down Romans 3, 19 through 21, uh, 1 Timothy 2, 6, Titus 1, 3, Ephesians 3, 1 to 10. And how Paul talks about my gospel, remember my, that personal pronoun possessive, Romans 2, 16, Romans 16, 25, we saw before in 2 Timothy 2, 8. So what God is doing now, he's forming a new entity, the one body of Christ. It's called a new man, right? It's the same Christ of prophecy. He's being our one Lord, one faith. It has a new doctrine, a new system of grace. We have one baptism in this new entity. Right. It's a spiritual baptism done without hands. Right. It's done by God. When you believe that Christ died for your sins and buried and rose again, then God baptizes you and spiritually identifies you into the body of Christ. One baptism. No water. Uh, no water. No, no H2O. Sorry. No earth, wind or fire baptism. Yeah, no, yeah, my apologies to the group, Earth, Wind, and Fire. Remember that? Earth, Wind, and Fire. Remember that group? Okay. Yeah, I, I like that group. <laughs> we heard. Yeah. <laughs> I, I like the group. <laughs> no water baptism is required. God ceased those types of things that were uh, Jewish practices. Right. Right? And that program was temporarily set, a, set aside. 
So our program came in, it happened with the temporary fall of the nation Israel from her favorite nation status with God. And God will get back to the nation Israel or earthly kingdom program after he's finished with our body of Christ program for the heavens. It's a wonderful program. Uh, you find out in 1 Corinthians, before you know, 1 Corinthians 14, 37, 2 Corinthians 13, 1 to 3, Romans 1, 1 to 6, Romans 11, 11 to 36, and Ephesians 2, 11 to 22, and Ephesians 4, 3 to 6. I know there's a lot of scriptures there, but uh, maybe get a copy of the tape and you'll be able to jot those down for your further study. Note also how in Galatians chapters 1 to 2, Paul has a personal appearance from Christ to go up to Peter and the other circumcision apostles and explain to them Paul's mystery secret gospel, the gospel of the uncircumcision. All right. And this takes place over in uh, Acts 15, and it's 14 years, over 14 years after the Pentecost of Acts chapter 2. So this meeting takes place there in Acts 15. And this shows again that Peter and Paul had two completely different messages. I mean, why would Christ send Paul up to Peter so Paul could explain to Peter and them Paul's gospel if they had the same message? What, what sense would that make? Why would Christ come down and send Paul up <laughs> to tell him about the same message they already knew? No, they did not know about this. And so now Christ sends Paul up to explain to Peter and company about that. So this shows that Peter... And Paul had two completely different messages. One message, as we saw, was spoken since the world began for the nation Israel and her literal kingdom program. That's for reconciling the earth that was given to Peter. And one message kept secret since the world began that was given to Paul. And that's for reconciling the heavens. And all of creation is going to be reconciled back to God through Christ, through these two entities, the nation Israel on the earth and the body of Christ in the heavens. And so what God is going to do with us, uh, you probably already know that is Satan and his whores are occupying uh, the heavenly places now. So it's going to be a war. God's going to kick those suckers out and put us in their place. Yeah, that's good. That's awesome. Like somebody said at the seminar, we're all going to have government jobs in the future. We'll be working for the kingdom. <laughs> I always wanted to work for the government because they make a lot of money. <laughs> uh, it's uh, two separate messages, all right? Peter and the uh, other little, we call little flock, Messiah and believe, Messiah believe in the earthly kingdom apostles. What they did was they resigned or they loosed themselves from the so-called Great Commission after they talked with, with Paul. We'll see that in a second. So Peter and company focused their ministry and their writings on the earthly kingdom disciples. And they turned their Gentile ministry over to Paul, who focused on the heathen. That now included Jews, the unsaved Jews, who uh, God now views as Gentiles now, uh, to form and grow the body of Christ. I know the Jews think themselves as being special now, but I, the Bible says they're, they're Gentiles. God's looking at this Gentiles. So when I meet a Jew, I say, hey, welcome, brother, fellow, <laughs> fellow Gentile dog here. Now you know how it feels to be a dog, <laughs> right? You're one of us. All right. <laughs> Let's go to Galatians 1, uh, 11 and 12. I'll, I'll show you. The scripture will show you. Galatians. 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 You see that in Galatians 1, 11 to 12, where Paul is saying that, but I certify you, brethren, Galatians 1, 11 and 12. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. Right? He didn't get it from a man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. So you're saying that a personal appearance of Christ, Christ gave me my gospel personally. He came down from heaven and gave it to me personally. And look at uh, chapter 2, Galatians chapter 2, verses 1 to 2. We'll start and then uh, 7 to 9. Galatians chapter 2. Then 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem. This is all after Pentecost chapter 2 and everything. With Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation. Is that word revelation? A personal appearance of Christ. Christ came down and told Paul to do this. And communicated unto them, as Peter and 11, that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. 
but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. So he had to, you know, he's giving them kind of some heavy message here, so he kind of wanted to do it you know, privately first. So they can understand it, the leaders can understand it first before they give it to uh, the followers. And then in Galatians chapter 2, verses 7, all right, Paul is saying here, they didn't add anything to me. He says, but contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of the urban circumcision was committed unto me, Paul, that's the, the grace gospel, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. See, that's the literal kingdom gospel. But he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision. So what Peter was preaching was effectually coming about. The same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And look at verse 9. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go to the, unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. Right there they resigned from the Great Commission. So if you're following the Great Commission today, then you need to follow James and Cephas, Peter. Resign your commission. Amen. Teach. Yeah. What are you, a general or colonel or something? Whatever it is, resign and come into the grace message where we are ambassadors for the king. Ah, that's really good stuff. So they resign from the Great Commission. And if you think you're following the Great Commission, you should do that also. Now, not to take a, a lot of time, I wanted to go over, well, you want to give up? Okay. I uh, was doing some work at the booth, uh, the McHenry County, so Bible Church up north was doing, had a, a booth, and they uh, sharing the gospel message. And this is my tool that I use. It's very, very uh, easy. So I don't have to get all carried away trying to remember things, and, and I can have the people looking at this rather than looking at me. So it's a kind of a busy thing, so I, cut, I, I kind of put it in half, right? I put it in half, I fold it in half, so that I have this before salvation first, that I'm reading to them, and I point out to them, that before salvation, you're on your way to the lake of fire, eternal death, separation from God. And uh, Romans 3, 10 says, there's none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of the God. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And what is the message you must believe? Because before salvation, you see that picture there, your sins and sin natures associated with you. Your, the Bible calls you and me a sinner before salvation. No one is perfect. People say, oh, well, I'm not a sinner. I'm pretty good. But are you perfect? Most people will admit they're not perfect. If a person says they're perfect, you might want to move on to the next person. <laughs> Come back to them a little later, okay? Most people will say they're not perfect, and that's the same thing as saying that you're a sinner. So you're agreeing with that. What must I do to be saved? You need to do the only thing you can do without doing anything, which is trust in what another has done. Believe the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 4, we read that. The gospel by which you are saved, how that Christ died for our sins. According to the scripture, he was buried and he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Galatians 2.20, he did this for you personally. This is a personal thing. The son of God who loved me, Paul says, and gave himself for me. This is very, very personal. When you believe that message, plus nothing, then I turn this over and show them the other half. What God does is take all of your sins and your sin nature and puts it on the cross. Then he judges it, takes it out of the way. And if he just stopped there, he would have taken you from negative infinity up to zero. That's not good enough. No zeros in heaven. So what God does is takes prices 100% righteousness and credits your account. So that in the eyesight of God, you are perfect. You have to be perfect to be in the presence of infinite, holy, and just, perfect God. So you need to be perfect. So now, now God declares you to be perfect. You're now a saint, and the Holy Spirit is in your uh, regenerated human spirit. And you'll see all the scriptures listed there. But this is what I call a divine credit card exchange. And now God has taken you out of Adam, put you into Christ. And what he has done is changed your spiritual DNA. You are now no longer in Adam. You're in, in Christ. And you have to think of yourself that, that way. If you keep thinking, you say, oh, I'm a sinner saved by grace. No, 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 no. 
You are a saint. Perfect in the eyes of God. You need to think and see yourself the way God sees you. And, th and then Christ himself will produce the Christian life through you. Amen. You won't need the law. Christ himself produces the Christian life through you. Just like he did when you first got saved. It's a wonderful thing. So I want to share that with you, a little tool you can have. And we can talk more about that later. So I will end it right there. I actually made it through everything. Very good. <laughs> Let's have a word of prayer. Yeah, most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins. We thank you for your word, by which we understand your will today, when the Bible is rightly divided. And we're trusting that whatever is said, done, and thought here today will be to your praise, honor, and glory that we would share with others. And we look forward to that in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Thank you.